a key scriptural principle, it's a key pillar of Christelphian faith, that we believe that there is hope beyond the grave. And one of the things that we um, hold dear as Christelphians, we put a clause in our statement of faith uh, to this effect. It's clause 24, as Brother Tim alluded to, when it says that at the appearing of Christ, prior to the establishment of the kingdom, the responsible, namely those that know the word of God and are called upon to submit to it, dead and living, obedient and disobedient, will be summoned before his judgment seat to be judged according to their works and receive in body according to what they have done, whether good or bad. And as Brother Tim alluded to last time, there is a coming day in which Christ will return to judge the responsible dead who will be raised from the grave. They will be joined together with the responsible living before Christ's judgment seat at his return. And just a, a note, that clause doesn't supersede anything uh, that scripture says we often say that it conveniently summarizes what the scripture teaches so there are a, a conglomeration of scriptural principles that summarize what we believe on this subject and as the clause summarizes the dead and living will be gathered together the dead will be resurrected and brought together to be judged and receive in body for what they have done and one thing that um, you'll notice and i've kind of highlighted in that clause there that the expressions of the appearing uh of the appearing of christ the dead and living, i.e. the resurrection, they'll be summoned before his judgment seat. All those three are somewhat synonymous terms because at Christ's return, the dead will be raised to be judged. And so those three events often we talk about uh, almost interchangeably in scripture. They do refer to three kind of distinct things, but because the timing is so close together, and we often talk about the return of Christ. It also infers that the resurrection is right there with it and that right on the doorstep of that is the judgment. So often you'll see those terms somewhat used interchangeably and for our purposes tonight, we're actually going to speak more about the return of Christ, because it is the event that immediately precedes the resurrection. And the focus then tonight will be the gap in time between here this evening and whenever it is in the future that Christ returns to raise the dead and to call the responsible to judgment. This gap in time, it might be as, as short as a few hours, a few weeks, or a few years. We're not told in Scripture. And for whatever reason, God in his wisdom has kept that a secret from us so that uh, we turn to scripture and hope uh, not motivated by you know some last minute attempt to sneak under a deadline that we know is coming in two weeks time or something like that god keeps it secret so that we genuinely seek out the hope that his word contains and so the, and one question if we're, we're talking about the resurrection then uh, why why would we concern ourselves with the idea of resurrection uh, especially if we're alive uh, here today it's a a doctrine that we'd say maybe only affects dead people. By God's grace, most of us here will never experience the resurrection, will be alive when Christ returns. Why would living people actually concern themselves with it? And there's a few points I'd say that first is, it's very presumptuous of me to say that I will be alive when Christ returns. We don't know the day and hour uh, when we'll be taken. And so it is, uh, well, we could say that the majority of us will be alive when Christ returns. We can't say that I certainly will be. So we prepare for the uh, the opportunity to be resurrected as well. The doctrine of resurrection also, there's a couple of verses I'd like us to look at on the screen there. It is a principle for living. And there's two verses. The first one's found in Ephesians 2, verse 5 and 6. And it says there, even when we were dead in sins, he hath quickened us together, raised us up, made us alive with Christ. And it says, by grace you are saved in us, raised us up together, and made us to sit in heavenly places with Christ. And so the whole principle of the gospel is taking us from a position where, in God's sight, dead in sin, but raised to live a, a higher calling, a godly calling in our life. And so each day of our life, we also live that resurrection principle by living to godly standards, not earthly standards in our life. And a second uh, verse that is good to put alongside that one in Colossians 3 says there, if you then be risen or resurrected with Christ, seek those things which are above so you're called if you know have knowledge of the gospel you should be living in a certain way seeking godly things or heavenly principles those things which are above where christ sitteth on the right hand of god set your affection on the things which are above and not on the things of earth and it goes on to say in verse five there mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth or put to death those things so the resurrection involves a um, a raising of our spiritual principles and a putting to death of of humanly principles Third point on that that I would say is that when Christ returns and raises the dead, the living responsible will be gathered at that same time to judgment. And so we are looking forward to that time of Christ's return, but we're also looking forward at a time where we will give an answer as well. So we look at this with the idea of preparing 
uh, with judgment. One other reference I don't have on the screen, but if you have a minute, we'll turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, because it is a also a warning to us as to why it's important and why we should understand this principle. Paul, in this verse, he's warning about the, the perils of, sound, or of uh, false doctrine and the importance of rightly dividing the word of truth. We'll actually go to 2 Timothy 2, and we'll start at verse 15. And it's a verse that, yeah, if you're familiar in Sunday school, you probably have done as a memory verse or have heard before. It says in chapter 2, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And in contrast to rightly dividing the word of truth, there is shunning the vain, sorry, profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And these profane and vain babblings, it says in verse 17, their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, these two members that uh, Timothy was familiar with. And Paul says, who concerning the truth of, have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. And so there was an error in understanding that ate like a canker. It was related to the resurrection, and not necessarily a denial of the resurrection, but even a particular detail of the resurrection that was overthrowing the faith of some that uh, were around. And so Paul's warning to us is that it is important to have those details concerning the resurrection uh, sound and fundamental because a correct understanding is important. It can overthrow or devastate the faith of some who get it wrong. So a correct understanding is part of sound faith in those things. And so this evening, as we said, we, it is an important topic to look at in all its aspects. Tonight we're going to look at the period of time between now and Christ's return. And as I said, we haven't been given a date or time but we have been given some guidance as to what the state of the world will look like before Christ returns. Signs that if we're looking for, we can see and we can prepare and order our lives uh, in order that we might be ready. We can look at those things and choose to raise our thinking to the way God would have us to do so that we might be prepared for Christ's return. So we're actually going to step back a little from our reading there and go back a couple chapters into Luke chapter 17 for a few verses. It's Luke chapter 17, and in particular, verse 26 to 30. And the section, the section follows on Christ being asked the question of when the kingdom of God should appear. And just we cast a glance back in verse 24, Christ tells the people that it's going to be obvious when it happens. You're not going to have to wonder if Christ returned. If you're looking for it, you're going to know. It's going to be as obvious as a lightning strike. But despite it being that obvious, a number of people are going to be unprepared for it. It seems kind of like an oxymoron that how can something be so obvious and yet so many people miss it? Well, what does Christ say about that? It says it'll be like the days of Noah and the days of Lot. In verse 26, as it were in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given a marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now, if we're familiar with the scripture record, we know what God said about the days of Noah. We know that God's way had been corrupted upon the earth. It says in Genesis that the earth was filled with violence and the story of Noah is the story of one man and his family witnessing to a world full of violence witnessing what God said was going to come upon the earth and if we're familiar with the story of Lot, we know it's a story of pervasive immorality immorality that uh, infiltrated every level or every section of society sin that God called very grievous and it was in that situation that Lot stood and stood in opposition to what was going on to warn about God's judgment on immorality. And so would we say that our world is any less immoral? Is there any less violence going on? Is there any less crime going on in the world than those days? Would it not at the very least rival the days of Noah or the days of Lot in what is going on? It certainly we'd say that we have cities, Vegas and New Orleans that are totally devoted to these principles of immorality. Surely there are places uh, that we would say are at least comparable to those things. But it is noteworthy that Christ's message from that, that era is not how immoral it was or how violent it was, 
He doesn't say, as it was in the days of Noah, they punched and they kicked and they boxed and they brawled and all these sort of things, and they, they invented new weapons to shoot each other with. It was that they did the daily things. They ate, they drank, they married, all those things. And same with the, the message of Lot's era. It wasn't about all the things that people in Sodom and Gomorrah were doing. It was that they bought and sold, they planted, they built it. All those things that we would say are day-to-day -day activities. And we know that in the right context, none of these activities are of themselves wrong. It was that despite living in a society that was obviously gone too far, that had corrupted itself, that had become uh, cankerous, nobody cared. Life was as comfortable for the people of that generation, so comfortable there was time to plant and build, to buy and sell, to go to weddings and to go to parties and enjoy great food and drink, all those sort of things. It doesn't say that as it was in the days of Noah, they scrimped and they saved and they starved to death and fought off all these great you know, perils to their life. These are people that had it very good. Not everyone in Noah's day committed violence. Not everyone in Lot's day participated in the sin of Sodom. And despite looking out a window and seeing the world in moral shambles, everyone continued to enjoy life as if it was going on. Noah's message didn't seem to resonate, or Lot's message didn't seem to resonate. They carried on as though the world was going to continue that way forever. And Jesus' warning then to us, for those looking for what it's going to be like in his return, he says, look for a world that has a lot of time on their hands, a world that's distracted with the daily things, a world that doesn't really think about what's going to happen tomorrow or that what might be coming. And just as soon as the, or suddenly as the party ended in Noah's day and in Lot's day, the return of Christ is going to come and change the world forever. Yes, we live in a moral age. Yes, we live in a violent time. But those aren't the issues that Christ tells us to look for. Look at a time when people are too comfortable to care. So let's come across to the verse we looked at. We're going to see something interesting here as well, I believe. The reading in Luke 21, I'm going to, for the sake of time, assume that you'll take my word that the words of Luke 21, the first uh, verses from 7 through 24, refer primarily to the time of the Jews leading up to the destruction of the Jews in AD 70. And just one uh, point to that, I would say, is in verse 24, where it says, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. It speaks of a time when uh, Jerusalem would fall out of Jewish hands and stay out of Jewish hands or in, uh, stay in Gentile hands until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And then if we're sharp with our history, we know AD 70 is when the Romans took Jerusalem and it never was under Jewish control again until 1967, just a, a relatively uh, recent event in history. So we have a bit of a timestamp given by Christ as to when the events of chapter 25 to 36 really should be uh, paid close attention to a, a spotlight or a focus is sharpened in at that point in time. And so in that section of verses as well, three different times Christ notes that the generation that would see this flip of Jerusalem back into Jewish control would also see his return. It says in verse uh, 27, in that section we read, Luke 21 verse 27, after seeing those signs and all those things, they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Verse 28 again, when these things become to, begin to come to pass, look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. And again, verse 31, so likewise, when ye see these things begin to come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. And so it is a, a telltale sign that that generation should pay particular attention that the return of Christ was going to be very close, surrounded by those events. And so what sort of things then was that generation going to see? Jesus in this prophecy gives us a glimpse. He gives us two things to look for. The first is in verse 25 and 26, where it speaks in there. It says, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon earth the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking for those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. So when the Bible speaks prophetically, it often uses those things like the sun, moon, and stars symbolically. It doesn't mean that the sun is going to necessarily fall out of the sky right before Jesus returns, but rather it speaks about uh, political sun, moon, and stars, and earth. And so just a, an excellent verse, if we're looking to, to prove that very easily, is in 2 Peter 3, 
uh, verses 5 to 7 and 12 to 13, because it really lays out the, the different heavens and earths and speaks to the time that they were uprooted and overthrown. Second so Peter 3, verse 5 to 7, speaking there, it says, For this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that, that, sorry, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. And so it speaks about the time of Noah's age and this heavens and earth and world that then was that perishes at that time. Well, the, the world didn't perish at the time of Noah, but the government and the system of things and the way things operated came to an end. And then Peter goes on and he says, but the heavens and earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of the ungodly men. So it refers to a period of time right now where the heavens and earth also exist. But Peter says, we're actually looking forward to the coming day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved. So again, the heavens are going to be dissolved at the coming of God or at the return of Christ. Those things are going to be changed. And we're going to look for when Christ returns, a new heaven and a new earth, as it says there, wherein dwelleth righteousness. So it speaks about a, an order of things uh, that are going to be taken and redone. And so it's particular there when it speaks about the, uh, in, back in Luke, about the sun, moon, and stars, and upon earth, distress of nations, it is the sort of thing because we know that at the return of Christ, there is going to be a, uh, a dissolving of the heaven and earth, the, the political way of things at that time. There is going to be a dissolving of that thing, or of, that, of those things. And so before the return of Christ, it would be fitting, we'd be looking for instability in the way things are done politically. There would be you know, upheaval and turmoil in the political system uh, of the earth. And so that is what it's referring to when we see those things. And we see... Uh, the words of si sorry signs there means wonders, things that have never been seen before in the governments of the earth. There'll be uh, upheaval, instability, uncertainty. Verse 26, it says that the powers of heaven shall be shaken. In earth, that is the, the, the population of those who are ruled, the, the general population, it speaks of distress of nations. And the word there for distress literally means to, uh, to press together or to apply pressure from all sides. In perplexity, it means they have no way out. They're, they're at a loss for a solution. There's anxiety, there's stress, there's worry. There's all these things that are going to come upon those who dwell upon the earth. So while the ruling powers, those who, who govern the earth, uh, are being unsettled and agitated, there's pressure being placed on the population at large as well. Uh, they feel like they're being put through a press with no way out. And verse 25 says, the sea and the waves roaring. Another good verse uh, that goes along to speak about the, the symbology of that statement from Isaiah 57, verse 20 and 21. But the wicked are like a troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. <clears throat> there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. It tells us that the wicked are like a troubled sea that are never at peace. And it is, a, it is this age before Christ's return uh, that will have sin or the, the agitations of sin affecting the foundation of society. So the, just an, an interesting note, the word for waves there at the end of verse 25 is the same word for shaken at the end of verse 26. The movement of the waves will shake the political heavens. The, the, the rising up of the population will actually unseat and undermine uh, the stability of the system that was there. There will be no cohesion in this uh, time because everyone will be going their own way. It won't be like a, you know, a smooth sea. Uh, it'll be a, a sea that is tumultuous. They're roaring. They're moving back and forth. It, if you look at a, uh, a lake when the water is uh, boiling in with waves, you can't pick a spot and say, well, there's a stable spot that I could go to. Everything is going every which way. There's nothing stable about that picture. And these few verses, 25 and 26, really do uh, sum up what we are looking at in the world today. Ten years ago, right now, there was the Arab Spring where democracy was supposed to sweep through the Middle East. We have things like Brexit. There was the Yellow Vest marches in France, uh, France that protested taxation and inflation. Hong Kong, where a million people entered the street to protest the Chinese government. Venezuela, everyone into the streets protesting socialism and the, the dire conditions that they had there. We had the U.S. protesting the fundamentals of democracy. We had the fall of Afghanistan in just in the last few months, an event, you know, the, the work of the U.S. military for 20 years wiped out in a few weeks uh, by the Taliban government. We live in a world where people have the power to agitate the systems that be, to shake the political heaven. And they do so out of a feeling of distress. They have no way out of their situation. 
in Venezuela where there is nothing. They, they have no option but to take to the streets and protest against the system. They have no recourse. They have no food. They have no money. They have no, they have nothing. And so out of a feeling of despair, a feeling of anxiety, of, of distress, of pressure from every side, I, I have no option, but I have to do something. And it undermines the stability of the world in which we live. There's an, an increasing sense of pressure in the nations. Christ gives a second sign there, speaking of the fig tree in verse 29 and 30. So the, there would be a, an uprooting and an undermining of the political uh, stability in that generation. But he also says in verse 29 and 30, and he spake to them a parable, behold the fig tree and all trees, all the trees. When they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise, when you see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of heaven is nigh at hand. And again, scripturally, uh, symbolically, the fig tree itself is a symbol of Israel. A couple of verses, one from Joel 1, verse 6 and 7. For a nation has come up upon my land, that's Israel, strong without number, whose teeth are like the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. And he hath laid my vine waste and bark my fig tree, that is Israel. Again, in Hosea 9, verse 10, I have found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first ripe fig tree at our first time. And so the fig tree then shooting forth scripturally or symbolically is speaking of Israel. And again, we have a, a, a second proof of that time stamp. We, we said in verse 24 that Jerusalem coming back under Jewish control is a, a symbol of the time or a, a time stamp that Christ gives us. At what point will we say that the, the fig tree shot forth and started to bear fruit? Well, it'd either be in 1948 when they were uh, reconstituted a nation, or in 1967 when they took control of Jerusalem, and the nation of Israel has developed and grown since then. So it does give us a common reference point in history to that, uh, to look at, but it also says, and all the trees as well. And again, just a another uh, reference to put in, uh, the nations can be looked at as trees, Daniel 4 verse 20 to 22 the tree thou sawest in nebuchadnezzar's dream it is thou O king that are grown and become strong and symbolically then scripture can use trees as a symbol of the nations and so when do we when in history would we say that not only the fig tree or israel shot forth but all the trees shot forth just over 200 years ago the empire of spain started to dissolve and a bunch of little countries shot up out of them i'm only going to use three examples that are fairly obvious out of the empire of spain over 30 countries got their independence and separated off from spain the british empire when it separated went over 60 different countries that split off and blossomed and more recently some of us will remember the soviet union that dissolved and out of it came 15 countries at the conclusion of World War II, there were 74 countries in the world. In 2022, there's 195 independent countries, 249 recognized territories in the world. So it's not just that there's unrest in the nations, but everyone wants a voice. Everyone wants to have their own country and their own identity. All these nations sprung out of nowhere in the last 100 years for certain, uh, 200 if we're generous. And so again, it, it points us towards a, a similar time in history that all these things would come to pass. Christ says there'll be a period of political instability. There'll be a period of time when men's hearts fail for fear and anxiety. And it'll be a period of time when the nations spring forth like the leaves on a tree. And so what is Christ's warning then at this time? Verse 34 in our section when we look at that there verse 34 he gives us a warning that when these things are going on he says in verse 34 take heed that you don't get caught up in all the political instability and the protests that are going on or take heed that you aren't caught up in forming independence for your country it's not the same thing it's the exact same message as the days of noah the days of lot the world is going in this direction god's people are supposed to stay separate those who are looking for christ's return aren't to get carried away with everything that's going on in the world they're supposed to be looking at something different just as christ said in uh in a world that was violent in the days of noah he didn't warn them not to be violent although you shouldn't be 
You didn't warn them to be immoral as in the days of Lot, although you shouldn't be. It was to not get carried away and distracted with all the things you had. And so same here, Christ's warning isn't to us, don't be, don't be caught up with all the political instability of the last days because it's going to be there. Don't get caught up in all the fear and anxiety because it's going to be there. Be on your guard because you're going to be distracted by the same things that the people in Noah and Lot's day were. In light of all those things, in light of looking at a world where you can see it as, as plain as writing on the wall, there is the potential to get caught up and miss what is going to be like lightning from east to west. And so what is Christ's warning then? He says, take heed or be warned, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged. It means to take on an additional burden or weight. And the burden will be things like surfeiting. It means to seize or grab hold of to the idea of taking more than you actually need. To seize uh, is to, to take to the point of having excess. And we often think of that in terms of food, and certainly that would apply nicely with the days of Noah and Lot. And we certainly live in a time where there's excessive food available, but excess comes in many different things. It comes in things like money. It comes with things like time on your hands. You have excessive uh, free time, uh, excessive status or work. In any material goods, there's all sorts of things that we can do excessively in this world. There's also uh, drunkenness, and it means uh, intoxication with alcohol. But again, scripturally, symbolically, uh, intoxication or drunkenness can mean also uh, false doctrine or corrupt thinking. It's a, a different way of thinking about things. And so there is a uh, no doubt that we live in a world where the thinking is intoxicated at best. We live in time when the, the cares of this life, or the, as it translates literally, the anxiety of the present existence. There are pressures uh, that we have or that we create for ourselves that have never existed before. We have new reasons to worry every day. And Christ says, pay attention at this point, because the temptation will be to choose the burden of intoxication or the burden of excess or the burden of stress and worry or creating those things when you should really be concerned with preparing for Christ's return. It's a very similar message to what was given to Lot and Noah. And so it is a, an important point to make that we should be paying attention to those things when we have the, uh, the potential to have excess or to have uh, a lot of time on our hands. It is then uh, that we should be prepared for Christ's return. And it's not to, it's not to say that the, the issues in the world aren't real or that we can somehow avoid them it's that we should be looking at them if we're looking for christ's return we look at them with a, a slightly different perspective it's that we know where that's heading and so we turn and look uh to god's word or look for uh strength from his word and so christ says in verse 35 to the ignorant to those who are unaware it's going to come like a snare and if we are familiar with how a snare works the animal that's caught in it uh, doesn't realize they're in the snare before it's too late. Their, their head is long way in it, and as soon as they either try to go forward, they go further in, or they try to pull out and the snare tightens around them, everything is fine until it's too late. The judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah came like a snare on them. The party kept going in Sodom and Gomorrah right up until the moment Lot left. The party kept going for the days of Noah right up until the rain started falling. Everything was going the way it always had right up until Noah entered the ark, right up until Lot uh, left Sodom, and then all of a sudden, it was too late. Just like a snare, it's going to be the same in the age of Christ. It's going to appear like everything is going to continue the way it always has, because it has for so long, people won't be able to envision a different way of doing things. It'll it'll seem like it, sh it can't go any other way. And at that point, we are told that Christ uh, will return. Christ, well, he warns about those things to not be distracted with uh, excess or intoxication or anxiety. He also does give us the antidote. And in verse 36, there's two important points uh, that we should take note of. The first is that we should watch. And it means to literally to stay awake. And it's the, the contrast of intoxication or excess. You know, if you drink too much or you have too much food, you start to feel sluggish and you start to feel drowsy. The contrast is to stay wide awake. And it's the, the language of a soldier or an imagery of a soldier that's on guard. He's not so much worried about what the, the army outside his wall is doing, but he's worried to make sure that he's prepared or that his fellow soldiers are uh, ready for the fight. It's constantly assessing or that soldier is constantly assessing the time that he's been given 
making sure there's sufficient time uh, being given to the things God asks. A good soldier is focused on what has been asked from him, not sleeping uh, when he should be on patrol. And the second thing Christ says is to pray always, to ask God for uh, strength, because it will be easy to be carried away with those things, to ask God for strength, uh, to focus on what is needed, not necessarily what's wanted, to pray for strength, to use our time wisely, to avoid the snares uh, that would keep our minds from being focused and clear. And we do so, as Christ says, that we may be worthy or accounted worthy to escape all those things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. If we are doing those things that God asks and we're um, paying attention, we're watching and praying, then we will be ready. We will be people that uh, won't be caught in the snare uh, that is about to fall upon the world. It is a, a situation that if we look at the world it doesn't give us a lot of confidence that things are going to be okay in the long term. There's a lot to be concerned with uh, if you look at it and look somewhat objectively at it. And what Christ is asking us to do, we ask the, the people of Noah's day, or God asks the people of Noah's day and Lot's day, to not get carried away or to not get overly concerned with the state of the world because we know those things are going to be dissolved. It is a, a lesson to focus or change your focus to a different a portion or a different lot in life it is to focus on uh, what's coming next or what is going to happen on the earth the next significant moment or movement prophetically that we anticipate is the return of christ we anticipate his return to the earth and to assemble that responsible class before him to be judged and once that call has gone out it will be too late for us to change the outcome for that day the story will be written it'll be too late to decide whether or not we are accounted worthy to escape the things that are going to come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And if we're looking at ourselves where um, we can examine our own lives or think about our own lives, are there any areas where we could be giving more to God or giving more to uh, his word or giving more to others? And we can all, if we're honest, we can just certainly say, yeah, we've got more than enough time on our hands. There's a lot more we could be doing to prepare our lives. So it is a an excellent warning for those who maybe have um, believed for a long time, but also for those who may not have um, as much time, it is an opportunity to think about how much time we are giving to the things God asks. So we're just going to close one other reference from the Gospel of John. Come over ahead a, a couple of pages, and Jesus kind of brings the ideas together uh, for us in a couple of different verses. In John chapter 5, two verses there, in chapter 5, verse 25, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. And if we go down a little, it, it seems like Christ is repeating himself there. He says in verse 28, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation and so is christ actually repeating himself in verse 25 and verse 28 and it's not repetition it's actually a distinction if we look at it this is speaking to us here and now verse 25 the hour is coming and now is that's us that is those who live in the time between hearing the word of God and before his return. They live in the time when they are those who are dead but will hear the voice of the Son of God and live. They are hearing Christ's invitation to do what he has asked, to live the principle of, res of resurrection in their life, to stop living those things that only have death as an outcome and actually live the way God has asked and in so doing make themselves heirs of life. And it is in God's eyes, his word that has that ability to reach the voice of those who are spiritually dead. In God's eyes, without his word, we're a, a dead corpse. And it's the light of God's word that can breathe life into that, that can transform a life that would end simply in the grave and turn it into something that is far greater, that can resurrect you, uh, spiritually speaking, in this life, to raise your mind to the things of God, to take you from being dead in trespasses and sins and resurrect you to a character that is full of life, living in the way that God would have us to do. And if we live that principle in our lives today, if we hear God's word, we let 
it breathed life into us. If we do all those things that God requires of us right up until we naturally die, it actually will be a, an inverse process that follows. We put to death the natural things in our life, we'll ultimately die, but we'll be strengthened once more because there will be a second call. There's the call now of God's word, but there'll be the call to resurrection that that next verse says, marvel not at this for the hour is coming. It hasn't arrived yet. It's coming in the future in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. And so this won't be one with opportunity. This will be one with a, um, a decision to be made. It will be whether or not you have done good onto the resurrection of life or have done evil onto the resurrection of condemnation. And so it is a, an, an excellent opportunity for us when we live in a, an era where we have more time than maybe people have ever had before. We have more abundance. We have more uh, things that make our life easier with more opportunities to free up an hour here and there. How are we spending that time? Are we doing things that are investing uh, in good so that we might inherit the resurrection of life? Or are we spending it just wasting it and not in, you know, putting up any inheritance uh, whatsoever? And so we ask those questions, is, is it worth it? Or if we weigh up the cost, is it worth investing in those things now using that free time that we're blessed with? Is it worth it? Is it worth it willing to sacrifice? Are we willing to sacrifice all the, you know, the excessive things that this world offers, all the distractions, all the planting, the building, all those things to inherit what God promises us, us lies beyond the grave? Will it be worth the effort and sacrifice that we make now so that we can experience the resurrection when Christ returns, what do we have to look forward to if we do those things? And if we give up all this life has to offer in pursuit of what God asks? Those sound like excellent questions that we will answer in our next lecture, Lord willing, in a month's time. Thank you.